You could see it in his energy. You could see it in his swagger. He was right with the world, it seemed. He knew it was setting up to be a tremendous day for him personally and for him professionally. Neil told me before the 500, I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life. You'll see something you probably had never seen on Fox. What I thought was the greatest day ever was heading in a direction that would make it the worst day ever. It was a bad day. It was a day that I hope I never have to live again. The rising sun shall surely set on days of triumph and tragedy alike. The 2001 NASCAR season dawned like every other, under the Florida sun, where the sport's biggest race of the year was also its first, the Daytona 500. Programs, who dare? Programs, get your programs. If Daytona was NASCAR's seat of power, one man sat at the head of the table, Dale Earnhardt. Take him to Daytona and let him go on those big banks. He was just magical, the stuff he would do. Dale had a knack for Daytona that nobody else had. The way he could maneuver, he knew what he wanted to do with a race car. He knew where he could put it. People used to say he could see the air, and Dale would debate you with that. He said, I can't see it, but I can hear it, and I can feel it. Um, he had an open face helmet for that reason. To run Daytona and run Daytona really well, you have to have no fear. You just have to be willing to keep your foot in the gas, and you really got to manhandle that car. That's when Dale was at his best. Earnhardt, Daytona. Two words combined to tell a Shakespearean tragedy of sport. Earnhardt won every race there was to win at Daytona, but not the 500. Never the 500. 20 years under an unjust sun. He was frustrated that his career would be measured by it, by some, somehow there'd be an asterisk next to his career that he never won the Daytona 500, no matter how many championships or how many races he won. At long last, Dale's day in the sun arrived. Check the flag, everybody. Come on around here, buddy. 20 years of trying, 20 years of frustration. You think about moments, and I still can see all those people lining up down the pit lane. Uh, everybody knew what it meant to him, and they, they honored him that day. Everyone knew that it took 20 years of hell. So when he did triumph, uh, it was a weight lifted. It was like there was a 12-year-old kid there. You know, that's what he sounded like. He was just so happy and so relieved and able to just celebrate this great event that he had been talked about not winning for so long. It, it was a big deal. That trophy right there, my name's on it now. They can't take it off. My car's going in Daytona, USA. I don't care. I love it. I want it to be there. I took me a little spin in the grass so I get the good out of it. You could see it in his face. You could see it in his demeanor. It meant everything to him that everyone said it was supposed to mean. From that moment on, he was right with the world, it seemed. Dale told me in 2001 when we were sitting doing an interview, I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life. How do you feel about Dale Earnhardt? A lot better, I've known you a lot better so today long. than I did uh, several years ago. 
uh, because of family, because of my life, uh, because I think I'm a, a better person than I used to be. I got it all right now, Daryl. I got it all. No, you really do. I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm a lucky man. I have it all. Crossing that line first. first. And then spin and around then in the infield. Spin around the infield. And then go to Victory Lane. Then go to Victory Lane, which is where I'll be do the interviews. Are oh, you going to be here? Yeah. What do you mean? Be <laughs> Fox brought their A team in here, man. <laughs> was the start of a new era in NASCAR. For new broadcast partner Fox Sports, Dale Earnhardt was the key to success. Just as Dale's key to success was Richard Childress, his car owner and closest friend. We had a whole lot in common. We raced our way up, we worked our way up to what we got. Nothing was ever given to either one of us. We had a bond and a trust in each other that I think that most men do not have. After several injury-plagued seasons, Dale was finally healthy and a favorite to win his record eighth season title. What people don't remember is uh, Dale raced for about a year with a broken neck. He had crashed at Atlanta early in the season and it cracked a vertebrae in his neck. And because they said the surgery was risky, he didn't want to do it. His right hand would go to sleep in the car, and I guess that was from pinching nerves, but he would drive with one hand and leave the other one over there on the bar. What people didn't know is when he, after he finished the race, we'd basically have to help him take his uniform off. I mean, he would unzip it, but we'd have to pull it off of his shoulders and get it down to that point. He did not get that surgery done until the season was over. And what they did was when they opened him up, there was a sliver of bone that had been chipped off that was wedged into his nerves. So he dealt with that for eight months. He told me once uh, Dr. Branch fixed his neck, he said, I'm a new man. In 2000, we came back, I think we finished second in the points, only lost it by a few. And all we could talk about that winter between 2000 and 2001, I felt that we were as prepared to win the championship in 2001 as any year that we had ever been. That Dale Earnhardt Jr. was ready to challenge Dale Sr. for the title was all according to plan. His son drove for Dale Earnhardt Incorporated, the team his father had built with a focus on the future. I don't think he did that just because he wanted to build something for Dale Earnhardt Jr. But I do think his belief in Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s talent had a lot to do with it. He's led 209 laps, and the Intimidator's son is the dominator today. I ain't seen you in a while. Hey, Superman. <laughs> yeah. Good job, man. And I remember Dale coming to me, and he said, I'm the envy of all the dads in the garage. And he just thought that was the coolest thing. And Dale Jr. won his first cup race in Texas. And part of my responsibilities was being in charge of Victory Lane. So, of course, I'm very excited. I have the Budweiser towel and the hat, and I'm ready to run up to the car. And this giant hand grabs me and essentially throws me to the ground. <laughs> so on national television, there's this red blur of Big E going right past and, and getting in the car. Of course, that was cool. And now here's the big man himself, Dale Sr. The picture of him squeezing his neck at the all-star race is a dear picture to me because he just really loved the fact that his boy could do the same things that he could do on the racetrack. DEI was founded on family and friends with three teams starting the Daytona 500. Dale Jr., Steve Park, and Michael Waltrip, a journeyman who'd never won a race in his 16-year career. Now, NASCAR's premier event would be his first race driving for his longtime friend. Just coming to my mom's house to see mom the day after my dad died. My phone rang and he said, what are you doing? 
I said, I'm over here with mom, just hanging out. He said, I'll be there in 10 minutes. And he hadn't mentioned coming or anything, but he just, he wanted to come and um, hold my mom's hand, you know, and just say, you're a, uh, you're a, uh, you had a special husband, you know, he raised these two boys and these guys are a big part of my life. And so I, I think that meant the world to mom. And I think it uh, showed a lot of people in my world that uh, he was a special person. Maybe Earnhardt saw a friend who needed a helping hand, or maybe he saw something in Waltrip that others did not. Michael Waltrip screaming along the wall. He got a pin it right up against the wall. He hit awful hard. You know, I had started my engine 462 times and hadn't ever been able to win a race. That is Michael Waltrip out of control. Try over. Time was ticking. Time was running out for me to be able to get a top ride. When Dale put Michael in the Napa car, and everybody said, have you lost your mind? He's driven 400 some races and had never, never won a race. Why do you think, why did you pick him? Dale always knew in his heart that Michael could drive. And he always felt like he needed, just needed an opportunity. That opportunity was at hand. With well wishes and good luck kisses lingering in the gasoline scented air engines were ready to start NASCAR's most important day. You're watching Fox Sports, home to the World Series, Super Bowl 36, and now, the 43rd running of the Great American Race, the Daytona 500. It's like you get the NFL contract and your very first game is the Super Bowl. Hi everyone, Mike Joy. With the 1989 winner of this race, Daryl Waltrip, after 17 years of trying, and Larry McReynolds, who's been to victory lane in the 500 twice as a crew chief. Gentlemen, I firmly believe with us going on the Fox Network and with the amount of promotion we, we had done, that we were going to get a very broad audience. So that's why we'd spent so much time with the camera angles, why we'd spent so much time with the audio, so much time with the graphics, so that when the big audience was watching, they went, oh, I get it. It's not just a bunch of rednecks running around a track. This is really exciting. And I kept hearing in my head, Bill France Jr. saying to me, you've got to stress, this is a sport. And so we had to, to, to lay out this wonderful picture about why everyone had fallen in love with the sport and why they'd fallen in love with the sport were these daring young men who were going to risk everything for glory. Thunder rose to life as NASCAR machines rolled off the starting grid. The day's events had been put into motion. Dale Earnhardt is the most prolific restrictor plate driver in NASCAR history. 11 wins and only 52 plate stars. Today chasing his 35th total victory here in Daytona. The plan was simple. He said, me and you and Dale Jr. are going to work together and win this race. Thought sounds great, but it doesn't sound very realistic. There's 40 other cars that are going to try to be messing that whole plan up. At Daytona, you can plan who you want to run with and who you want to draft with, and then they wave the flag. This vehicle is in. The 43rd annual Daytona 500 is set to get underway. Terry Bradshaw waves the green flag. We're racing. When the race started, my car wasn't exactly right. It was loose, and so I needed to work on it. Look at Mikey. He's got a handful. That's what we call a handful. When you get the wheel pulled way around there like that, he's got a he's got a handful of steering wheel. I can't but help but notice the front of the roof here on Earnhardt's car. It's like it's buffeting. It's because Rusty Wallace, the car in front of him, with that roof flap across the roof or that roof fan, it's putting dirty air and it's making the air on Earnhardt's car mad. It don't know what to do. And here comes Earnhardt down the inside. Under Marlin, three wide through the trioval, and he almost took the nose off Marlin's car coming back up. I believe Schrader led that lap. He did. Good man, Schrader. 
the first 150, 70 laps, basically, I, I saw them, but we really never, there's too many cars. We never could really get together and team up. Look at Earnhardt, right down to the apron to take the lead. With Jeff Gordon pushing in the 24 car, Dale Earnhardt Jr. in the red car, the eight car pushing with him. Dale and Dale Jr. got to the front in a hurry, and I, I, I kind of rode in the middle of the pack for longer than I wanted to. Then the crew made some adjustments and made my car right. I could drive the heck out of it. Looks like a 